All right, in this video, we're going to go through uh, the cumulative review through October 31st, 2012. Uh, it's our first quarterly exam on Friday, November 2nd. Um, so here we're going to we're going to cover a lot of things that we've done up to this point in the year. So uh, if we think back to the beginning of the school year, we first started talking about units. Uh, units being the uh, the way we address our standards for measurement. Um, if we think back to, to those first couple of days, we, we talked about how we measure uh, the mass of an object. Uh, so mass in a formula of well, a measurement of m and our units for that are kilograms. So once we've plugged in a unit of mass into a formula in place of the m, the number will be followed by some designation of, of kilograms. Um, meters per second, well, we know that meters per second can be written like that. That's a measure of the velocity or speed of an object. Um, so the measurement will be velocity in a formula. We'll plug in for V with units of meters per second meters per second squared, that's going to be our acceleration. Meters, measurement of displacement. So for example, I walk 10 meters to the north. The Newton. The Newton is our measurement of force, which in a formula is represented with the F. So for example, F equals MA. Okay, but it's important to note that a Newton is also equal to a kilogram times a meter per second squared. The last one here, second, once we've plugged in a number, the corresponding unit that goes along with it will be this, the letter S. And we're plugging in for a measurement of time. Okay, so now when we measure things, there are two different types of measurements uh, that we can talk about. The first being a scalar. Now the term scalar refers to any measurement that only includes a magnitude, or in other words, size. So for example, we might say 10 meters. This is our magnitude, and this is our unit. Now a vector on the other hand is any measurement that includes not only magnitude but also direction. So our example here would be 10 meters towards the left. So let's continue on with this idea. Question number three asks us to consider a car that's traveling 15 kilometers due north. Right there, we know that that 15 kilometers is a vector because they also included the direction due north. Now, it's standard notation to use north, south, east, and west when noting uh, directions. So I, I generally try to stay consistent with that. So this car travels 15 
kilometers due north, and then it travels eight kilometers due east. Notice that my eight kilometer vector that I've just drawn is longer than my 15 kilometer vector. Excuse me. My, my 15 kilometer vector is longer than my eight kilometer vector. Um, so if, if you were to make that trip, someone else could make that same trip, if they had the capability of doing so, of traveling directly from where you started to where you finished. Okay, when we draw what's called a resultant vector, we always start where we started and finish at the exact same place. Okay, now to figure out the length of that distance between those two uh, points, that's a term known as displacement. So displacement is not how far you went this way plus how far you went this way. It is simply what is the length of this resultant vector straight along that line there. So to do this, this is a straightforward Pythagorean theorem problem. So I know that the square root of a squared plus b squared is length of that hypotenuse. So plugging in numbers here and careful to include units, 15 kilometers in parentheses squared plus 8 kilometers, also in parentheses squared, gives me 289 kilometers squared. In this case, that displacement winds up being 17 kilometers. Now, upon first glance, this next question, number four, looks very similar to number three. It's asking us, what distance does the car travel? Well, remember the this up here was a helicopter flying from the starting point to the ending point, and this distance was 17 kilometers. But the car mentioned in the in the question had to drive up 15 kilometers and 8 kilometers. So the car's displacement was also 17 kilometers because it it finishes 17 kilometers away from where it started. But the distance, okay, the distance is going to be simply our 15 kilometers plus 8 kilometers, giving us a total of 23 kilometers. It's worth noting here that distance is a scalar, whereas displacement is a vector. Because when we talk about, uh, when we talk about uh, displacements, we're referring to not just how far away it is, but also the direction. So, be sure to note the difference between distance and displacement. All right, in this last question on the first page, it's asking you, what is the approximate diameter of a basketball? So, let me just draw a meter stick here for reference. If this were a one meter stick, Okay, about how big in reference to that meter stick would a basketball be? Well, if I think back to holding a meter stick, I would say a meter stick would be about maybe a little bit bigger than three basketball diameters widths wide. So maybe I could have three of these or a little more than three of these wide, making up one meter stick. Maybe about three and a half basketballs would be equivalent to one meter. So I would say that the approximate diameter of a basketball is somewhere on the order of about 0 0.3 meters. On to page two here, we're asked to consider a situation where we neglect friction and we're asked to draw three graphs for an object that's been dropped from a plane that's accelerating towards the surface of the Earth. They ask us to give them a displacement as a function of time graph, a velocity 
as a function of time graph. And lastly, an acceleration as a function of time graph. So if you think it, about it, we know that an object dropped from a plane, as time goes on, it's going to fall further and further downwards, right? So if we assume that the height of the plane is our zero point, our origin, as time goes on, it's going to fall increasingly further and further as time goes on. It won't be a straight line, all right? Now, if we think about what's happening to the slope of our displacement as a function of time graph, it starts near zero. It becomes more and more negative. Now, remember that our displacement as a function of time graph's slope represents the velocity of that same object. So if we start near zero and our slope gets increasingly more negative on our displacement as a function of time graph, that tells us that our velocity as a function of time is decreasing. Now, the slope of velocity as a function of time graph here, if you recall, represents the acceleration of this object. Okay, so the acceleration of this object, because we're pointing downwards towards the right, is going to give us a negative acceleration. Okay, and it just so happens that this value here should be familiar, 9.81 meters per second squared. That is the acceleration due to gravity since we are neglecting friction. Question number seven, we're asked to... Uh, look at a situation where we have two forces acting concurrently or at the same time on an object. We have a 10 Newton force acting towards north and a 10 Newton force acting towards the east. So if we were to add force one to force two using our rules for tip to tail to scale, we recognize that our resultant vector would look something like this. So Consequently, the result of these two individuals pulling in such a manner would result in a net force, using Pythagorean theorem, of 14.14 newtons. It happens to be 10 radical 2 if you recognize that this would be a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. So 10 radical 2 newtons, uh, which again is 14.14 newtons. Now the force required to set this into equilibrium would be some third force pulling along the same axis, but in the opposite direction with the same magnitude as our resultant, such that if we were to add up All three of, whoop, sorry about that. Here to add up all three of, it's not working for me today. If we were to add up all three vectors, now our, our equilibrium, equilibrant, excuse me, plus the two original vectors, they would get us back to where we started from. So our net force in this case, or the sum of all of our forces, would equal zero. Again, this red here is called the equilibrant, the force required to bring a situation into equilibrium. Question number eight, we have a car that's traveling a distance of 25 kilometers in a time of 0 0.25 hours, okay, and we're asked to find the average velocity. Well, average velocity is the distance divided by the time. So if we plug in our numbers of 25 k or times 10 to the third meters divided by 0 0.25 
hours, but I like to express hours in terms of seconds since that's our base unit, which would be 3.6 times 10 to the third seconds. Picking up our calculator, this becomes an easy calculation if we've converted everything to scientific notation because it works out to be 25 meters divided by 0 0.25 times 3.6 seconds or 25 meters divided by 0 0.9 seconds or lastly 27.78 meters per second. On to number nine. Number nine we're asked to consider an acceleration as a function of time graph. Acceleration measured in meters per second squared, time measured in seconds. So let's assume a case where we have a constant non-zero acceleration. And let's say that acceleration here is 2 meters per second squared, and it goes on for 10 seconds. They're asking us, what does this shaded area represent? What quantity does that area represent? Well, if we just think about this as being a simple geometry problem, the area of a rectangle is equal to the length times the width. Area equals, well, what is the length of this rectangle? It is 10 seconds. The width of this same rectangle is 2 meters per second squared. If we multiply these two together, we find that the area is 20 meters per second. That's the key to this question. Our final units work out to give us velocity. So the area under an acceleration as a function of time curve is velocity. Okay, the last question we're going to address in this first part of this video is uh, it's a question that asks us about a vocab word. So they're asking us what the term used to describe the fact that all the forces acting on an object are balanced and cancel one another out. So in other words, the sum of all of the forces is zero. Again, that being the Greek letter sigma, meaning the sum of. So the sum of all the forces equals zero. There's a special vocab word that we've learned, um, and it is known as equilibrium. Now, equilibrium is, is, is very important that we understand what it means. It means that if one person pushes on an object that way and another person pushes on that same object in the opposite direction with equal magnitude, the object does not accelerate. So in these cases, acceleration equal, excuse me, acceleration equals zero. This does not mean, however, that velocity must be zero. An object can be moving in equilibrium. So if an object is moving in equilibrium, it must be moving at a constant velocity. 